come back, uh, take us away from the brink of mortality and with advancing uh, risk, bring us all the way back to the low risk patient. And we'll talk just about the Cervantes uh, criteria, that very small percentage of patients, about 10% in that analysis that had low risk disease. Um, Christina, um, do you see these patients? Um, and would you ever consider therapy for a low risk patient, symptomatic or asymptomatic? Yeah, so patients definitely present with low risk myelofibrosis. And in those patients, this is where we're really assessing, are they associated with a symptom burden? And so in those patients that have low risk disease by the DIPSS or the, the MIPSS 70, um, these kind of more sophisticated prognostication tools, um, but they still have a significant symptom burden. Those are patients that we can consider intervening. Um, I recently worked uh, with the CIBMTR and uh, a group of academic centers looking at the role of stem cell transplantation. And interestingly, there was a, even a group within that analysis with low risk disease that actually proceeded to stem cell transplantation. And so I, I think that uh, some physicians would say that for the treatment of myelofibrosis, the only true curative measure is allogeneic stem cell transplantation. And in patients that are wishing on a more aggressive and disease modifying approach, that even in low risk disease, some physicians are proceeding with that. Now there's not significant evidence to support that approach and really the best evidence is in the uh, intermediate two and higher and more recently uh, really considering a one a disease. Um, so again, looking at the patient's goals, their risk status, their symptom burden. In general though, for low risk disease, we really just monitor these patients, monitor their counts, see if they are transitioning more to a higher risk phenotype, a higher DIPSS. Um, are they having molecular evolution? Is there more high risk mutations that are occurring over time? And then we're taking all these pieces of the puzzle to really decide when to initiate therapy and how aggressive to initiate therapy. Well, thank you for that, Christina. And, and you prompted a question I was going to ask you later because I noticed from our panel that um, you are the one member of our panel who is a believer in stem cell transplant. You are a transplant <laughs> physician. Um, I think that's also because you're probably the youngest and it is a young person's job to take care of these, uh, these patients. Uh, so I'm going to come to a question for you, okay? Our challenge in picking patients for the curative option of transplant is the data is in intermediate and two and high risk, but those are often the patients who are cachectic or have huge spleens and all, all these other issues that may preclude them from being an ideal transplant candidate. On the other hand, you have low risk patients who may be very healthy and be able to undergo stem cell transplant even with its risk. So my question for you is, is there anything that you use in that low risk patient to um, talk to them more aggressively about transplant, i.e. mutation analysis and cytogenetics? Does that influence your, your opinion? Absolutely. And so, and that's a, a really great question. And so, um, again, we're using these molecular characteristics to really help guide. Uh, we know that there are particular high-risk phenotypes within myelofibrosis, particularly the triple neg negative patients, the CALAR, um, uh, jacb 67 f as well as nipple, all negative, as well as ASXL1. Uh, these are extremely high-risk uh, phenotypes, uh, genotypes that can uh, certainly have a higher risk of transformation uh, to acute myeloid leukemia down the line. And so the idea of intervening when patients are a bit younger, a bit more robust with higher performance status, fewer comorbidities, less splenomegaly, less cytopenias, it, it certainly um, is uh, attractive for, for, a diet, for a conversation with the patient. Um, there are certain approaches. And so for patients that are developing more splenomegaly, certainly we can use ruxolitinib as a, a bridge, so to speak, for controlling the, the splenomegaly, the symptoms, um, before we take them to allogeneic stem cell transplant. But again, this is, this is such an institutional 
approach. And so every institution, every academic center for transplant will have a different approach and a different discussion. Um, and uh, I think that it, it's as a community, we're really moving towards an earlier discussion. And for community physicians, I would like to impart the importance of early academic referral. And so often we see that these patients are referred to, referred to academic centers when they're already very symptomatic from their disease, they have intermediate to or high risk disease, and they're saying, oh, now it's time to transplant. But no, really, it really could have been a lot uh, smoother. Uh, 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 the donor selection, it takes time. Um, all of these things take time. So if it's early within the disease course, it really can be better for the, the patient. I'm jumping ahead in our agenda and I'm gonna keep you on the spot as our, as our local expert here. So um, let's say you have a patient, um, a, a, a myelofibrosis patient. Um, our, uh, I've heard that uh, if you don't do a myeloablative preparative regimen, you might as well not do it in a patient with myelofibrosis. It's not going to work. Any truth to that, or does it? How do you select the preparative regimen? Well, uh, I'd like to clarify. I'm not an allogeneic stem cell transplanter, <laughs> so I, I close actually, enough. Close <laughs> enough. <laughs> I have done, you know, some some research in this area, and so in general, this is again a very polarizing issue within the transplant community, and there is not significant data that would sway to myeloablative versus reduced intensity conditioning, and this is again an institutional uh, preference, and so um, you know I think this is really needs to be looked at in the literature. I, I think that we it's a challenge because myelofibrosis is a rare disease, and to do prospective analysis in this is very difficult. Um, so I don't know if we'll, we'll ever really achieve that. So continued, you know, look at this retrospective analysis, um, I, I think will help move the ball forward. But to answer your question is really, it's, it's polarizing and uh, it's controversial. 